great to see you all here. It's very exciting to see so many people here for Summer Institute 2015. You know, the first year this happened, there were four small tables in a little conference room, and it's a bit overwhelming to see how many faces that are out there uh, covering how much geography across North Carolina. We're delighted that you're here and looking forward to some really great times over the next couple of days. As you heard, the theme for the conference is design, create, and inspire. And I'm gonna need your help over the next few moments. As you know, the people who've been with us longest, we really rarely do anything that doesn't have uh, participation and engagement involved. So I'm gonna need your help. So I'm gonna ask that this third of the room, uh, you are design, and the third kind of in the middle are create, and the third over here, if you could be my inspire people. And so uh, let's give it kind of a rehearsal quickly. Okay, that was pretty good. In fact, better than I really expected. But I'm gonna ask the Inspire people maybe if you could give it a little bit of jazz. So get ready for your part again, okay? Oh, I got jazz hands. That was even better than just jazz. Great job, everybody, great job. Um, we um, want to sort of mention a couple of people before jumping, in, jumping into some comments. The first is, we're delighted today to have Rebecca Garland with us, the Deputy State Superintendent of Public Instruction. She's moved away from the front. Where are you, Rebecca? Oh my gosh. She's in the design crowd. That's kind of what I would expect for her. Delighted that you could be here, Rebecca. Also, I would like to ask, uh, scattered around the room are members of the North Carolina New Schools uh, staff. Would you stand and please stand for a moment? <laughs> so eyeball these folks and get to know their faces because they have one purpose during our time together is to serve you to help you meet your needs and solve your problems. And if there's anything that they can do during the time that you're here, please let them know, please let me know. Uh, we all live in service to those of you who work in schools and in districts. From the very beginning when this work started, our emphasis has been on the notion of design. Early on, we talked about design principles and we talked about aligned instructional systems or common instructional framework. We talked about even in some of your, our partners, the development of the engineering design process. It's kind of a fundamental part of our relationship. And we've learned in working with you over the past several years that the notion of design brings with it some amazing power. Because people who possess the notion of design are claiming the resources in their environment, building off of their intellect, and erecting solutions that make change in their school community and in their community. Generally, designers are people who shape and influence the world, and they determine the kind of world that we will be living in going forward. And I'm noticing that I have a dead clicker. Ah, great. Um, during the time here at Summer Institute, you're supposed to. Still working on those jazz hands down there. <laughs> Still working on those jazz hands. It, it is this notion of empowerment, the ability to act, and the clearer that we get about design choices and how we use resources to make decisions in our environment, it elevates our power, it elevates our uh, profile as professionals. And over the past year, since many of us were in this room together, we've had lots of cause to feel sort of diminished as education professionals. There are endless debates about testing and budgets and TAs and not TAs, and it just seems like at often the local and the state and the national level that there are people who just may not get what it is we're charged to do. And that can rob us of our sense of enthusiasm. In fact, it's robbed some people of their commitment of the profession. And in many cases, we're seeing that enrollment and teacher preparation programs across North Carolina and across the country are on decline. That's a source of real concern. That's a source of great concern. 
Also, since we were here uh, together last year, in mostly the national media, we've seen way too many instances where people in authority are acting against people in the community in ways that really aren't consistent with our values, ways that sometimes seem incredibly uh, violent and threatening to the things that we care most about. It's that uh, experience of what's happening in communities and through the media that led to the notion on the national level that all lives matter, that all lives really do matter. And can we separate the concepts and the concerns that come with all lives matter from the things that we do, the things that you do in your districts, in your schools, and in your communities? Certainly not. Most of you come to this network, you come to the work that you do because you already know and are committed to the notion that all lives matter. That concept's not something that comes to you from the media. It's something that comes through you from your spirit and your intellect and your life experience that moves you through the work that you do. Many of you have talked to me and to our staff and you are so excited about the things that you're creating in your schools and the way that you're approaching the needs of your students. And I hear most often from you that you talk about bending the things that are available to you to meet the needs of individual students. Do students fit into schedules or are schedules meant to be changed based upon what you know and learn about your students? Despite the realities of your community or even the realities of state politics, ways that you assert yourself in the work that you're doing to create a different kind of reality and a different kind of reality uh, outcome for all children. If we truly mean that all means all, we are called upon to act. We are called upon to be designers of new solutions uh, and new opportunities uh, for young people. In fact, the notion of design is really now sort of a global phenomenon. Designers all across the world are transforming the earth as we know it, both visually and in through advances in the arts and science and technology. Almost every aspect of our lives are being recreated in ways that couldn't have been imagined in the last century. Uh, the easiest way of thinking about that is through the physical world, and you see around the world, in fact, this notion that blending art and architecture and stressing the engineering around materials is leading to some of the most uh, creative and unusual types of buildings all around the world. And these are just some of the examples that you can find in the global race to blend art and architecture through notions of creativity and design. When I think about designers and someone who has owned the reality to create a new opportunity, I think about this fellow. Uh, this is Gustav Eiffel. Most of you might know the name Gustav Eiffel. In 1889, there was a competition uh, to create the gateway to the World's Fair. And Gustav Eiffel, as an entrepreneur and a creator and an architect, decided he would enter into uh, that competition. In fact, the competition led to the creation of the Eiffel Tower, the Eiffel Tower. But when Gustav Eiffel was trying to create the, the tower and he presented his plan to the committee of the leading intellectuals in France and in Paris, he was ridiculed and at one point run out of the room. His creation was called an abomination. They said the elevators wouldn't work because they had to operate on a slant, that the industrial design was an affront to the sensibilities of the Parisians and of the French. And today, his creation that sprung from his imagination is a cultural icon that defines France and is one of the most recognized uh, structures in the world. And some say it is the focal point for the city of love. The important thing was that Eiffel persisted in the presentation and the realization of his vision. And the only way he was able to get the tower through was to say to the committee, I'll tear it down after a few years and it'll disappear. But for now, for the World's Fair, we'll enjoy this beautiful structure. I share this example because designers 
take on a certain amount of heat and friction while they're trying to move from image to reality. And that the price people pay as designers and creators who can lead to a more imaginative experience in the world often pay an extraordinary price. We see the success, not the sacrifice. We often see the final product, not the journey. And the same can be said for most of you and the work that you're creating in your communities. It doesn't come especially with some of the new innovations that are being designed in partnership with business and industry and higher education. It doesn't come without some sweat equity. And on the front end, I was just talking to our colleagues at UNC Charlotte, the new school there. It doesn't really come without having to overcome resistance and inertia and those who might question our motivation or the practical realities of the vision that we have. So the question I have for today is how do we gain strength in persisting when the inevitable opposition comes to creating new experiences in education? One of the ways that I think we can learn or lessons that we can learn is from the field of medicine. Because of an experience I'm having with a member of my family, I've had the opportunity in the last several months to spend time with one of the country's leading surgical oncologists. And there was a key moment in listening to her talk. She was a remarkable person. She said, you know, I can't really issue a treatment plan until I have the team together and we look at the data. We need to know what's on the scan, what's on the x-ray, what's on the blood work, and we need to know the data from other patients who have similar challenges in their healthcare lives. So here you have one of the most powerful and highly compensated, I might add, surgeons in the country recognizing that her wisdom and her strength comes by virtue of the team and how that team can collaborate and solve uh, together. One of the other reasons I like thinking about healthcare and that notion of collaboration is the failure rate that exists in healthcare. How often do uh, physicians and medical teams succeed with 100% of their patients? It's very rare, right? It's very rare. But what is really very reliable is that with especially complex medical uh, cases, that team gets smarter over time. It's not what they do as individuals. It's how they have a common language, a common set of expectations, and a common communication and support system so that as the most difficult cases come through, and that hardship, by the way, might be complicated by issues of income and social status and support in addition to the actual health issue that promoted them to move into seeking health care, very, very complex circumstances. So it's the wisdom that comes out of that, it's the recognition that healthcare professionals grow smarter over time by seeking to individualize care to meet the needs of all of their patients, not some of their patients. Here today, with the beginning of Summer Institute, people, we did not serve wine at this lunch. Love you guys, just love you guys. Uh, the question behind all of this is how do we collaborate to get smarter? It's not clever turn of phrase, it's not some sort of theory, it's just bottom line. If we want the profession to be elevated, if we want to sustain the respect in communities and the respect among uh, elected officials and get ourselves out of the quagmire that we often find ourselves in, it is, those notion, it is that notion of a common language and a common approach, and I'm gonna talk about a little bit of that in just a moment. At North Carolina New Schools this year, we have a series of new developments that I wanna talk about before turning the program over to our keynote speaker. Um, we are also in the process of redesigning and thinking about our work in new and different ways. Um, one of the first things I want to mention is that we're improving our supports for you, and I had the staff stand in part so that you could recognize the people that you can speak to uh, about ways we can continue to improve our work. If we're not being responsive to your needs, then we're not getting it, and it's your job to help us to set a higher and higher bar. Otherwise, why would we spend time together? Why would you do this? Except for maybe the wonderful air conditioning. We value the air conditioning. Um, this year, uh, we are launching uh, a new 
uh, organization called Breakthrough Learning. And this is the first public announcement of that. We wanted to make this announcement with you because you are our professional family. Uh, breakthrough Learning is in part a recognition that we've grown so much um, and that our relationships now extend outside of North Carolina. So principally, our uh, partners and colleagues outside of North Carolina will know us as Breakthrough Learning. Uh, here in the state will, for the time being, be uh, known uh, as we have been known as North Carolina uh, New Schools. So this is a very big step and a milestone for our organization. We wanted you to know this first before it's released uh, to the broader public. A part of the transition to Breakthrough Learning, as I said, is recognizing those new colleagues and partners who have joined us uh, from other states, and they are here with us today. I would like to ask if they would please stand our uh, partners in from Mississippi, South Carolina, Illinois, and Indiana. Please stand, you all. So when you see them in the hallway, you know, give them a sticker, give them a badge, give them a high five, give them a hug, you know, do whatever you have to do to be sure they know you care and that we're all in this uh, together and they'll be with us uh, throughout the conference. Another new development I wanted to mention to you in person instead of via an email has to do with our relationship to charter schools. Uh, for two years our board of directors has spent time talking about public charter schools and how can we as an organization be thoughtfully engaged in uh, collaborating with charter schools when it makes sense. When the charter can make a commitment to equity as you have, uh, principally that's represented by access to transportation and access to meals. Uh, so joining us this year for the first time is our first new charter partner, the Northeast Academy of Aviation and Advanced Technologies, and that team is somewhere over here. I think I saw Andrew Harrison team. Andrew, will you guys please stand up? so we all can know where you are. Um, they're on the campus of Elizabeth City State University in northeastern North Carolina, one of the poorest communities in our state. And that's, again, one of the reasons we took that big step as an organization. We recognized there needed to be a new and different kind of support in that community. The NEAT school, as it's known among our team, the NEAT school will also provide professional learning for teachers and administrators across that region, and we're delighted to have that new uh, partnership. The last thing I wanted to share with you has to do with what we call our approach, and it sounds kind of basic because it is. Uh, we call it our approach to excellence, which essentially rides off of uh, three large components. Um, but those components exist on a backdrop around community. Every community is different. Every context and history and the resources of a community, the access to higher education and business and industry, you know, the politics, everything is different about a community. And our fundamental approach is to respect those differences, to spend time thoughtfully examining the community differences and asking local district partners and school partners for understanding about community context. We all know if we don't uh, understand and attend to the needs of a community that our approaches to do important new work will be undermined over time. Uh, on that backdrop are three core elements. The first is uh, talent, and that is building the knowledge, skills, and capabilities of educators. Uh, our core business, of course, is in professional learning, and it's our goal to be the best available source for professional learning that you can find anywhere in America. And I don't say that tongue-in-cheek. On any given week, we're somewhere around the country examining who's doing professional learning and asking how can we do it better. The second part of that is conversations with districts and schools about an embedded system of professional learning that is owned within that district and owned within that school so that it exists and improves over time. A notion of how do all adults in a school district and a school continue their knowledge acquisition and skills acquisition over time as a part of the day-to-day -day functioning of that institution. Again, I'll use the example of medicine and how medicine is driving greater knowledge and greater skill among medical professionals. Secondly is the notion of design. I've already talked some about that. Uh, design for us means a long list of things, all of which emerge from the local community. That can be an aligned, assist, aligned program of instruction. It can be a clear adoption of design principles. Uh, it can be explicit and clear and measured connections into business and industry. 
Obviously, it's a connection into post-secondary education. We believe in the very near term, every district, every school is going to be a blended and uh, secondary and post-secondary opportunity for children, and all children have access uh, to college and the support to achieve in college, regardless of what school that child is being uh, served in. Third and last is a focus around quality and how are data streams being used uh, in a school, all types of data streams being used in a school to improve that talent and professional learning and to improve the ability of adults to make design decisions. We don't all get designs right on the front end and so it's the use of data and the uh, observation of data among teams is going to improve our ability as professionals to make the kinds of student-centered choices that will capture the trust of parents and capture and sustain the trust of elected people. So those are the three uh, main uh, components of our approach uh, to quality. And you're going to hear us talk a lot about that this year and going forward as we deepen the work and the documents around our approach uh, to excellence. I think that as I uh, close today and we move into our program, I wanted to talk just a moment about um, the, kind of the moment that we're entering into here. And it seems a little bit corny, but maybe not, that at your chair and to your left and to your right um, is a beating heart, is a beating heart. And around your table and across there, this room, we have over a thousand people who are all gathered together. All of those hearts that are beating in this room. And I kind of wonder if it were possible for us to be quiet enough if we could be quiet enough, could we hear those hearts? Those hearts are the thing that move us forward in the knowledge that all lives matter. All needs all. Those hearts are the thing that elevate our thinking to access our intelligence, to think about how we do the work we must do to succeed with all students. So as we go through the conference over the next few days, I hope that we will attend to each other's hearts and inspire and motivate each other to do the important and complex work of transforming education in North Carolina. It is my absolute pleasure to welcome you to Summer Institute 2015. Inspire. Did I catch you off guard? Yes. Were you sleeping? Do you want to try again? Yes. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Love you guys. Please welcome Susan Simpson, a wonderful instructional coach with North Carolina New Schools and our Master of Ceremonies for Summer Institute. That'll be wonderful. 